Well, hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Rick Chatwell. Thanks for, thanks for coming tonight. Um, you know, a few times a year, probably six or seven times a year, we do a knowledge night. And, um, and so between the docs and, the, and our mid-levels, our nurse practitioners and our, our PA, we, we try to just do something fun and interesting and try to keep it kind of simple. I try to start on time because your time is important. And I'm going to try to be the only doctor that you know that doesn't keep you waiting. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. And um, so anyway, I think we'll probably go about 30 minutes of slides, and then, then my best part of the evening is I'll just open it up to you, and it's a free-for-all. So whatever you want to talk about is, is fair game, as long as it has something to do with rheumatology. I don't know anything about birth and no babies, so, <laughs> so let's, let's stay away from that subject. Um, but uh, we'll just kind of we'll go with it. So uh, this exciting title is called Keeping Your Cartilage Safe from Osteoarthritis, and um, I you know, I told him I told him I wanted to talk about cartilage and osteoarthritis, and the marketing people came up with this this you know catchy phrase. So I'll try to make it like that. So we'll try to see what that has to has to do with anything. To me. So anyway, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the structure of the joint, so just so you have an appreciation for what the cartilage is and what it does, and and things like that. You know, while. While there are a lot of different structures in the joint, the cartilage really is a, is a very important aspect of it. I mean, we talk about the bones, we talk about the muscles and the ligaments uh, when dealing with uh, features of osteoarthritis, but the way the disease is typically characterized is specifically based upon what happens to the cartilage. And, um, and we talk about the hyaline cartilage. And what you'll see here is a, a typical structure of a joint um, Right here, the the looking. This is in a knee that's actually been under arthroscopy. So, the, the orthopedist is actually looking inside the knee, and this metal thing is his probe here, and this is the tibial plateau or the upper part of the shin bone. Okay, this is the meniscus. When you hear about uh, athletes tearing a, a cartilage or tearing a meniscus, this is what they're referring to, and then this condyle here is the lower part of the thigh bone. Okay. So where the thigh bone and the shin bone come together, that's, that's the junction that we're looking at here. And that's what we're seeing right here. This, this blue part, this aqua blue part, is the business end of our discussion today. It's, it's, um, it's the cartilage. And, and what you'll see in this microscopic view, here's the cartilage here. Here's the part of the subchondral bone here. And that's the top of the surface. So what you'll, what you'll see in this is that this, this clear blue stuff is the extracellular matrix. These little uh, seed-looking things, they're, they're actually holes, and they're called, the holes are called lacunae. And these lacunae hold a cell called a chondrocyte, and this chondrocyte lives in its own little world, basically unrelated to any other cell. I mean, you can see to, to a cell, this is a, you know, a world apart. And, um, and so what it does is these cells make extracellular matrix. They make this cartilage. Now, what you'll also notice is, Unlike the subchondral bone, where you see this section of this, this uh, blood vessel on end where the blood, the blood is being stained a different color than red, but, but you see this vessel on end, what you'll notice about the cartilage is that it doesn't have any blood vessels at all, okay? It's, it's avascular. And so what happens is that then the, the cartilage has to get all of its nutrients through osmosis, just basically soaking in the nutrients from, from, the, from the area around the, the joint. Now, the joint... In the peripheral, in the peripheral limbs, are, are are basically surrounded by a joint capsule. Okay, and this joint capsule keeps the fluid and the jelly and everything else inside, if you will, jelly for lack of a better word. The synovial fluid sits in here, and it bathes this entire cartilage region. Okay, and so it gets all the nutrients it needs to feed these cells just through the diffusion through the through the cartilage. Okay, <clears throat> so if you're wondering if you've ever looked at a chicken, the end of a chicken leg or a chicken bone, that glistening surface is the cartilage, okay? And, uh, okay, so if you're kind of focused down further and actually look at the cartilage and say, well, what is that extracellular, that, that light blue extracellular matrix made of? It's made of uh, this, this uh, collagen matrix and all these little things in here, what you see is you see these, these units of, uh, construction, okay? And this is hyaluronic uh, through here, and that's, if anybody's ever had a, a certain type of knee injection where they put that, uh, 
um, uh, chicken collagen in, in the knee joint. This is basically the, the construct that they're putting in as this part of the thing. And then, but what you see off of this, you see a linking protein here, you see a core protein matrix, and then you see this chondroitin sulfate and this keratin sulfate here. And this, this right here makes up the building block off of this, off of this uh, uh, line structure, if you will. And basically these act as shock absorbers and they're also very <coughs> uh, hydrophilic. And what I mean by that is that they really draw water to them. These are very negatively charged. They're, re, they're uh, different types of glucosamine products, if you will, and they, they attract water. They're negatively charged, they attract water, and so this just acts as like a, a shock absorber, if you will. That's what the cartilage does, and it protects the end of the bone. Now, the other thing about cartilage is that the cartilage doesn't have any nerve endings. So, you know, if, if you were to you know, touch it with a needle or whatever, you wouldn't feel it. It's only if you went down and actually touched the bone would you feel the, the covering of the bone has some nerve endings. So what we see over time is we see a degradation of this or a teardown of this, this unit right here. And as they all start to fray, then that's when we start having more trouble with our cartilage. Okay. Much like bone, we thought cartilage was a very um, static type of uh, organ. But, I mean, by that I mean once it's made, it's, it's just made and it's, that's just the way it is. You know, kind of like, like tires on our car, you know, they just, <clears throat> they're just there, they don't really go anywhere, they're just there, you know. Um, but what happens is, is nothing can really be further from the truth. The cartilage is a very metabolically active kind of area through the osmosis or the collection of the nutrients that the chondrocytes need but, but to also what happens when the, when the cartilage or, or the joint is under stress, certain chemicals are released that affect how the chondrocytes behave, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Again, the chondrocytes are the actual cells that make cartilage, okay? So with the experience that we've gotten through the advances of immunology, we have a better appreciation for exactly what the, what the environment the cartilage lives in. And so that's what people have been trying to focus on is, is, okay, if the chondrocytes make cartilage, what can we do a, to affect, or, or basically fertilize them so that they do better? I mean, what, what improves their metabolism? And then, and then what can we do to try to prevent the cartilage from being torn down? So anyway, so the search is on now, okay? We, we kind of understand what, where the problem is. The question is, what can we do about it? And so people have been looking into the idea of connective tissue structure modifying agents. In, rheumato in rheumatoid arthritis, we have what we refer to as DMARDs, or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So much in the same way as we're looking for uh, an agent in rheumatoid arthritis to help slow down the progression of arthritis, we're now looking for agents that will slow down the progression of destructive or degenerative changes with respect to osteoarthritis. <clears throat> and so people are looking at, in fact, chondroprotective agencies. Uh, agent substance that protect articular cartilage from destruction, and and what can we do to encourage regrowth and healing, and then what they they've kind of stolen from the the rheumatoid literature. Now what we're looking for is disease modifying osteoarthritis drugs, okay, and so and these may be even drugs that I kind of think about a little bit differently. I don't know if the the original authors thought about that, but I I think about this in the sense that these are usually. Uh, some kind of variation of the cartilage constituents, what I showed you before, hyaluronate, um, you know, core proteins, the glycosaminic glycans, all the structures that make up cartilage, where these may be actually drugs that have some other effect other than being a cartilage constituent. Maybe they slow down inflammation or they do other things in that regard. And in vivo just means in the living body, okay? We talk about research, we talk about bench research, where we're looking to see what cell does what in a test tube, okay? That's in vitro, in a, in a test tube. This is, what we're interested in is what happens inside people. Okay. So despite our advances in understanding this, you know, we're, we're still at a point where we don't have anything in the armamentarium to actually do that. I mean, we've had some very interesting and promising things, but thus far the FDA has not uh, found any worthy to be approved for the use in the general population. <clears throat> so again, the question of clear-cut efficacy, even though some have been shown to be of some benefit. <coughs> okay, so this is the current list of candidates of, of consideration, and this has been the list that's been around for a while, 
And we'll kind of talk about these as we go down, so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking here. But, but as you can see, there's some interesting things, and some that may surprise you. Uh, glucosamine, everybody talks about glucosamine, and everybody wants to know what it does, and that's a really good question because nobody really knows what it does. But it does seem to help some people, and that's important. Uh, and then corticosteroids, or steroids, uh, people don't want to avoid the use of steroids, but in, in physiologic or low doses, they may actually be beneficial to people in osteoarthritis, but we don't traditionally use steroids in that regard just because we oftentimes don't want to deal with the consequences or the side effects of the drug itself. Okay. Now these little, you know, yeah, I, I put this in here because you're thinking, oh my God, immunology, what's that? Basically, it's a study of how our immune system responds. The immune system in a crash course of, of a terminology is, basically the immune system is our police force. Its job is to protect self from non-self. And non-self would be things like viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, those kinds of things. So anything that is not us, our immune system responds to. And it can respond to over a billion different separate things. And it's very, it's very amazing. We truly are <coughs> fearfully and wonderfully made. So when we're looking at this, um, you know, not only do they produce growth factors and things that can actually help the cartilage <coughs> build and do things, they basically run their own environment. Like you said, you know, they were their individual cells, and sometimes they're they're exposed to something that they <coughs> they get to, and they actually turn themselves on, and also can turn themselves off. And so <coughs> that's what it is. They're they're exposed to some stimulant. It could be stress. It could be some kind of inflammation or something like that. And so the chondrocyte responds by, by creating a protein that then comes back on itself, okay, and then from that it, it then creates another protein. So it's a, a very elaborate system in looking at how that works inside those little lacunae. Okay. So when you're, when you're making the cartilage material, a, a lot of it, as you can tell, is, is from locally produced growth factors because, again, there's no there are no blood vessels to send stuff to the chondrocytes. They basically have to make their own or steal it from somewhere. <clears throat> and these things are insulin-like growth factors and transforming growth factors. And so then there are also other inflammatory kinds of uh, uh, materials when the, when the joint is stressed. Maybe, maybe it's because the joint was injured and the joint's not, not behaving the same as it did before because we're walking on the joint differently. Okay, then what happens is the body responds to that irritation with inflammation, and, and interleukin-1 appears to be one of the major roles in, or major players in, in this particular problem. Okay. So what it can do is it can not only, catabolic just means it, it can tear down cartilage, and what you can see is not only can it tear down cartilage, it can also suppress the making of new cartilage, and that's what's referred to as the agrican and the, and the collagen. Okay. So, in case you were wondering what all is going on inside that cartilage, you know, this is just, this is one of the, actually, one of the calmer slides that I, I, I looked at. So, but, and again, there's not a test after this, but um, it, it's just to, to let you know that there's a lot of stuff going on in here that, that the, the cartilage deals with, both chemically and physically, to, to relate to the issue of trauma and inflammation. Okay. So, all this slide is to tell you is that with, with the onset of, of inflammation uh, and the activity that the, the chondrocytes and the cartilage participate in, they have to deal with IL-1, okay, that we talked about before that, that tends to create inflammation, tends to tear down the cartilage. But they also have to in, deal with other proteins that are there. Metalloproteinases are, are active. The receptors that recognize this are active, and it all leads to increased uh, compromise. So then we start looking at, well, what, what are these drugs going to do that are these compounds going to do that are going to help us? Well, there have been sulfate of polysaccharides, or just fancy ways of saying there, there are different types of cartilage proteins that um, people have tried to put together in kind of a, a mix master kind of thing to see how they work. Of one of those things they've looked at was a chondroitin sulfate. And we've seen in, in this particular thing, it also stimulates the synthesis of that hyaluron. Remember, that's that long, snaky-looking um, um, uh, rope that, these, that the chondroitin sticks to. Okay. 
And then when we look at chondroitin sulfate, they've actually done uh, formal studies on this. <coughs> Random is they take, they take, you know, basically all comers. Double blind means neither the patient receiving the drug or the doctor dispensing it knows what's, what's actually being given at that point. Placebo control just means in that trial, they had an active compound they were looking at, but they also compared it to a sugar pill, you know, a placebo to see how it works. And what they have found in this situation is that chondroitin sulfate actually has disease-modifying properties in retarding the progression of, of cartilage damage. Um, but again, the, the question is, well, how well does it do that? Okay. Avocado and soybean extracts, again, the same thing. It decreases the destruction, the, the catabolic activities. It increases synthesis of the cartilage here, and it inhibits that IL-1, the bad guy we talked about before. Metalloproteins inhibits all these as well. So there's a lot of things that, that the avocado and soybean extracts uh, can, be, can be helpful. Okay. Um, we talked about that, about shutting this down. And again, in this situation, it appears that in certain situations, this has been effective. And what they did was they, looked, they took uh, animals and they basically damaged their cartilage. And then they, then they test them with this extract to see how well they did, so. Okay. So the other ones that we're getting to something you may, rec you may, you may hear, because <clears throat> we, we see this a lot. There are certain antibiotics, okay, doxycycline is a certain form of a tetracycline, and minocycline is typically used for treating acne and things like that. It's also been used in the treatment of early rheumatoid disease. And one of the reasons, or one of the reasons we found out that that was true is because with patients that had received antibiotics in the past that had rheumatoid disease, they actually reported that they felt better while taking the antibiotic. And so people got to wondering, well, well maybe rheumatoid arthritis is caused by bacteria. Well, we've never been able to prove that, but what we found was the drug actually, the antibiotic actually had anti-inflammatory capability, okay? And so what they found in this situation with doxycycline and minocycline is that because of the, the anti-inflammatory properties, it shuts down this metalloproteinase uh, enzyme, okay? Decreased the IL-1, the bad guys we talked about before, and so as a, as a response, then the, what they refer to as down regulation of nitric oxide synthetase, and that's what uh, creates um, uh, more inflammation, okay? So the idea is that if you decrease the inflammatory pathway, then you're going to help spare, spare your uh, cartilage. Okay. <clears throat> so what they did was they tortured little, not tortured, <laughs> they, they, <laughs> experimented. Uh, they Hartley guinea pigs. I've never seen a Hartley guinea pig, by the way, but um, he's a cute little thing. Um, and so what they did was they, they, they looked at, you know, treating uh, these guinea pigs in, in, in an actual living uh, organism and seeing what happens when they have damaged knee joints. Do they get better? Do they, do they get worse? And what they found was they, they significantly reduced the progression of the osteoarthritis in that little guinea pig's knee by using this, and they also verified it in a different, uh, they, they took stray dogs and did the, same, they did the same thing, okay? Now, the downside to this is, <clears throat> for, for, to kind of relate to this, I mean, if, if you're looking at this in a, in a human uh, scenario, I mean, you're talking about taking this antibiotic, 100 milligrams twice a day, I mean, if you had an infection that you're using doxycycline for, you'd probably use it for seven to 10 days and you were done, okay? But they're talking about, you know, twice a day for 30 months. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of pills, okay? And so, but there were actually studies looked at, looking at this, uh, and actually they saw that there was a decrease in the rate of joint space narrowing. Now, when you're, when you're looking at an x-ray, um, cartilage um, is not calcified. It's, it looks invisible in the x-ray, okay? But when you're standing, the, the bones are, are separated because there is cartilage there. If you had no cartilage, then all of a sudden the bones are sitting bone on bone. So what they found out in, in these, these studies is they were measuring, okay, here's where we started and where did we end? You know, did we, did we slow down that, that narrowing or, or, or did we not? And so in this particular instance, they actually saw, <coughs> they actually saw, um, the regression or the slowing down of the nearing related to the osteoarthritis. Okay. 
diacerine is is akin chemically to the tetracycline, so you'd almost expect it to behave similarly, and in fact it does. Decreases the IL-1, uh, reduces the inflammatory nature of the nitric oxide. MMP is the fancy way for selling, telling you that metalloproteinase that I was talking about before with tetracycline, that's what MMP is. Okay, and so it reduced other other pro-inflammatory chemicals listed there as well. So again, it does very similar to the tetracyclines. Okay, and so in the two trials where they looked at that, <clears throat> this was a three-year study looking at almost uh, 270 patients with with osteoarthritis of the hip. And so what they found out was that they had they had decreased radiographic progression in the group that took it. 47% versus the placebo, which was 62%. And so, and this was again confirmed with a similar study with another 300 patients. <clears throat> but again, you know, objectively, I mean, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to see this kind of research, but the problem is, what you have to ask yourself is that over three years, you know, if, if all you're seeing is basically a 15% improvement over placebo, is that really is that really clinically meaningful? I mean, are you really, I mean, how many people do you have to treat to see a little bit of improvement, you know? So, um, but again, interesting research nevertheless. Okay, then we get to glucosamine, everybody's favorite thing to talk about. Okay, well, we know glucosamine, much like the others, you know, you know gets after the IL-1 um, and it kind of slows it down. Um, but when they look at all the things that kind of trigger or signal IL-1 to become more active, glucosamine doesn't seem to, affected any of those. So the question is, what exactly does it do and how does it do it? Okay, but it does reduce a lot of other pro-inflammatory things. Again, our favorite, the metalloproteinases, it slows those down and decreases the inflammatory uh, nitric oxide. Okay, so <clears throat> this was the largest to date, this was the largest glucosamine trial done in this country. And this was basically uh, on the heels of a lot of European studies that showed that glucosamine sulfate uh, was, um, was a big help for people with osteoarthritis. Uh, glucosamine sulfate, interestingly enough, in Europe is a prescription drug. In this country, glucosamine is an over-the-counter food supplement, okay? So, but at, because it was a prescription drug in Europe, it had to be made to pharmaceutical grade, okay? So you knew exactly how much was in it, how much was, you know, how it was made and how it was processed. So different. So what the Americans tried to do in this instance is they were trying to say, can we reproduce the positive benefits that the Europeans have seen, okay? And so <clears throat> they did a short-term trial, it was only six months, looking at the effectiveness of glucosamine hydrochloride, chondroitin sulfate, alone and together to see what would do. And so what they did was they looked at nearly 5,300 patients. And we actually had a few patients, in the, the arthritis center actually had a few patients in this trial, by the way, which is kind of interesting. Now, there was a, a large group, over 1,200 or nearly 80% that had mild pain and about 20% that had more moderate to severe pain. And the average age for most, most people <coughs> were uh, 59 years. And, uh, and that shouldn't be a percent, it's 64 years in women. And so, I'm sorry, it was, the mean age was 59 for all, and it was 64% of the group was women, I'm sorry. And so what they did was they looked at the treatment arms, they looked at glucosamine hydrochloride, and this may be important later on, the hydrochloride part may be in interesting. And so they looked at chondroitin sulfate by itself. <clears throat> Again, both are cartilage constituents, okay? And then they used the combination together. And they chose these doses because the literature suggested that these were the typical doses that people had responded to previously in other studies. Okay. Then they compared it to celecoxib, <clears throat> what we know as Celebrex, okay. and then they also compared it to a, a sugar pill. And then, then la lastly, <clears throat> in between study visits, if you wanted to use Tylenol, you could use a pretty good dose of Tylenol, that's 4,000. The FDA is now only recommending 3,000 a day of, uh, of acetaminophen, but back then it was 4,000 a day. And as long as you stopped at 24 hours before your pain assessment, then, then you were permitted to do so. Okay. And so what they found, what they found was, I just want to go back to be sure that, yeah. Okay. What they found was that, to no surprise, all the people that took the non steroidal wing, uh, the, the Celebrex, they actually showed a significant pain reduction, which is, which is what we would expect to see. Okay. 
So what shocked me about the study was 70% found the Celebrex to be helpful, but 60% of the people that took a placebo thought it to be help, thought the placebo was helpful. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the mind is a powerful weapon, you know, so it's, it's, we can't underestimate that. Anyway, so what they found that there was basically no significant differences between the other treatment wings and placebo. So it really didn't matter what you did, they all worked about the same, with the exception of celecoxib. Now, what, what they did find out was that for that 354, about that 20% that had, that had moderate to severe pain, they did find that glucosamine combined with chondroitin sulfate was significantly beneficial uh, when compared to placebo, probably 80% to 55%, okay? So that was, that was helpful. And um, for the participants that had the milder subset, it, it really didn't seem to be statistically significant. Now, for most of these studies, you had to have an improvement of at least 20% in your pain reduction to be considered significant. Okay, so then looking at trying to reconcile this with the European studies, because again, glucosamine sulfate in Europe, glucosamine hydrochloride was tested here in this country. Well, why the difference? Well. I think one of the differences is, of course, in, in Europe, it's a prescription drug, okay? And so a lot of the gurus that study this seem to believe that the sulfate form may be more active. It's also more finicky. It doesn't last as long on the shelf, and it's harder to make, okay? So now, if you're a, if you're a supplement company and you're not regulated by the FDA, you want to make the cheapest brand you can make and one that sits on the shelf the longest, okay? So they make glucosamine hydrochloride. And so people are wondering if, it's, if that may be part of the difference as to why people responded differently. So <coughs> Cochrane is a, is a well-known review organization that, that pulls together a lot of different studies and tries to glean uh, overall information about it. And so what they did was they gleaned, they pooled results of a lot of different studies, about 2,500 patients. And they found that one particular brand made by Rada Pharmaceuticals called Dona, or D-O-N-A, and it, which is actually available in this country, by the way, uh, was superior to placebo in the treatment of pain and functional impairment by the Lucane index. There's two different indexes looked at, Lucane and, and Womack, and these are two basically universities fighting each other over whose, whose assessment scale works better than theirs, you know. So, <clears throat> so on this particular one, the, the Rada brand was, was superior. Um, in the, all the other, pre, all the other preparations that were not the glucosamine sulfate, all the other non-RADA ones, failed to show any benefit of either pain or, or function. So, and then looking at this other osteoarthritis assessment index called WOMAC, which comes from Canada, uh, the outcome of pain, stiffness, and function didn't really show a superiority of glucosamine over uh, placebo for either the RADA, uh, the RADA brands or the non-RADA brands. So again, we have one study or one, one um, index survey that says, yeah, the Rada Pharmaceuticals brand really may be the one to go with. And then you have another index that says, well, really they all didn't work, you know, they all worked about the same, which was not as good as placebo. So fortunately, the one nice thing is glucosamine seems to be as safe as a placebo, which is nice. <clears throat> so what I do for my patients is, you know, because patients want to come, they come to me and they say, well, what do you think about me taking glucosamine? Well, number one, I, I, I tend to favor the Rada brand just because, you know, if there is one out there that seems to be a little bit better than one of them, at least I have some scientific evidence to say the Rada brand pharmaceut or pharmaceuticals may be a, the way to go. But then what I tell them, I say, try it for three months, okay? Either it helps or it doesn't. If it doesn't help in three months, then stop it, okay? And so you're talking about a $100 test. It's probably going to cost 30 35 bucks a month to try to try the glucosamine sulfate. But within three months, you'll probably know. Now, if you're having a placebo response and you think it works great, then I, yeah, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so, so again, we get back to, you know, is this a structural uh, drug that helps us work better or is it, you know, is it truly a disease modifying uh, drug? And, and that's still controversial. Um, um, and, and again, this is probably why. I mean, if we just knew how it worked or why it worked, because if you think about it, okay, you're taking basically a structural component of cartilage, 
which is a very complex things of uh, you know proteins and and, and uh, sugars and stuff like that, and you're ingesting it orally, okay, it's torn apart by the acid of the stomach, and somehow it still makes its way to the joint. Okay, so I'm not entirely sure how that works, and I'm in good company because nobody else seems to know how it works either. Um, so anyway, when you, when you look at the study designs of this one particular study, the question you have to ask yourself, is there a difference between the sulfate form I talked about and the hydrochloride form? I think there is, but that's just my opinion that has no scientific bearing. Um, <clears throat> and the question is, if you do pick the sulfate, is there a difference between using a pharmaceutical brand versus a non-pharmaceutical brand? Because as you know, with food supplements, because they're not regulated by the FDA, they tell you what's in it, but they're not really required to prove it. So, okay. And then, of course, the question is, how much do you dose it? And um, in defining other conditions in these studies, in the cells or in the, in the studies to, to make you wonder, because there's, there's one other big point when you talk about studying osteoarthritis that makes you wonder about how to interpret this data. Now, we get to the corticosteroids I talked about before. Again, it goes after IL-1, which is great, okay? It, it seems to inhibit the degradation of the extracellular matrix or the cartilage at physiologic doses. <clears throat> Most people don't know that, but prednisone is made by our body. About five milligrams a day is made by the adrenal glands. And, uh, and so what they're talking about is they're talking about using a dose of prednisone less than five milligrams a day and seeing what, what happens. And, um, and so oftentimes I wonder, especially in our, our really advanced um, uh, patients, you know, those, you know, 90 plus years, you know, I, I often wonder if, you know, three or four milligrams of prednisone a day is not necessarily a bad idea. You know, they feel better, their joints hurt less, and, and I mean, I, I've seen this over 25 years of practice. Um, again, there's not a lot of proof and not a lot of uh, other doctors really want to support that idea of, of trying that, but I, but I think there's some, I think there's some uh, evidence to suggest it's helpful. And so, anyway, it works to help produce and affect the synthesis of the ground substance, meaning the cartilage itself. Okay. So there have been some studies to suggest, at least in experimental uh, models, where you know animals have been they've they've had their joint injured, and what they do is they then inject them with with intraarticular steroids <coughs> or even systemic or oral steroids, that there is there is an improvement in their in their rehab. Um, but there have been study after study to suggest that, that steroid injections in knee joints are no better than placebo. And I mean, I can't argue with the study, but you know, that's not what I see in my office every single day for the last you know, 25 years. I mean, people, people, you know, people call me and ask for them. They don't, it's not like I go beating on the door and say, hey, come in for your injection. You know, they, so I mean, it must be helping somewhere to help these people with this. And so here were three studies looking at the at the role of uh, this. I've never seen a pond nuki dog either, but uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I like, I like the name, so I put it on here. Um, <clears throat> but, but you know, I've seen it in humans as well. So there's a lot of, lot of interest in corticosteroids. We're not gonna see much, we're probably never gonna see that published only because um, it's politically incorrect to talk about using steroids in the treatment of osteoarthritis. Okay, so it has to do with medical politics and not medical science. At least that's my take. Okay, so well, what are the pitfalls? And, and this is really the important thing. I, I've talked to you a lot about immunology, and I apologize. Um, I've talked to you a lot about what these, these particular substances or drugs might be able to do to slow that down, and I think a lot of it is a theoretical consideration. But the thing, the thing that makes osteoarthritis difficult to know and to, and to deal with is that studies, you have to do studies over years to see how osteoarthritis affects the joints. You know, it doesn't happen overnight, you know. Um, it's not as rapid as rheumatoid arthritis. You know, when we finally show up with osteoarthritis on our doctor's doorstep, it's probably because the process started 10 or 20 years earlier, okay. But then what happens is this, and this is the key word here, is mechanical. Because what happens is if the joint is damaged, and you've heard this before by your friends and family, you know, if you damage a joint, then somebody says, oh, well, 20 years from now, you're gonna have more arthritis in that joint because you damaged it playing football or doing whatever. And they're probably true because what happens is, is you affect the mechanics of the joint. Even if you don't damage the cartilage necessarily, 
if you, if you stretch the ligament, you tear the ligament, or you do something different, all of a sudden that, that knee joint is not working to its peak efficiency as it once did, and maybe it's throwing off the, the pressure within the joint, and then, and then that ultimately leads to cartilage injury and then more damage. And then as the joint becomes more damaged, the mechanics are thrown off even more, and it's just a, a cyclical process of a, a downhill slide. So it's not just the inflammation, it's not just the immunology of the joint, it's also the mechanics of the joint. Okay. And so that's the question is why do, why do pharmacologic treatments fail? And I think that's it. <clears throat> the dynamic stresses on the cartilage by the mechanical damage of the joint. Okay. And then the other thing is, okay, well how do we measure it? Um, the first glucosamine um, study that got my attention showed a 0.3 millimeter improvement in cartilage, actual, an increase in cartilage of 0.3 millimeters over three years. I got to thinking, wow, that improvement, that's, that sounds pretty good. Three years, that sounds like a long time. And then I got to thinking, 0.3 millimeters? Uh, again, is that really clinically significant? I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that if I had to take a pill for three years that I would be happy with a 0.3 millimeter improvement. So, but anyway, nevertheless, it is interesting, and I, and I think that kind of stuff, though, is going to lead us to, to explore more about how do we study osteoarthritis more efficiently so we can actually get some, some data. And again, there's have, the trials have to be large enough and of sufficient duration that we can actually meaningfully say something. Okay. Now, a couple of, sti a couple of sticks in this mud as well. <coughs> um, you know, osteoarthritis is a painful disorder, and I've spent a lot of time talking to you about cartilage, okay? But I also told you at the very beginning, cartilage doesn't have any nerve endings, okay? So if cartilage doesn't have any nerve endings, then why is my knee painful? You know, if, if I'm losing cartilage, but, and it's probably how it translates to what's going on underneath the cartilage, underneath the bone, uh, at the bone level, is with the loss of cartilage, we're sending more pressure through the cartilage into the bone, and the bone is reacting, and that is, in fact, the trigger for our, um, uh, our pain in the knee or, or hip or wherever. Okay, and then down here, if we, if we take one of these structural protein or structural drugs to try to improve our cartilage, okay, if it doesn't help pain, okay, or if you can't prove that it works, you know, no one's ever going to buy it or take it. And certainly, insurance is never going to pay for it. So, again, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of research yet to be done. There's a lot of interesting science, a lot of interesting promise, but, but the jury's still out. Okay. Again, if we're looking at it, what we may need to be asking ourselves is, okay, maybe we need to start treating osteoarthritis earlier, okay, before the joint is really damaged. Maybe that's when we need to be treating it. But again, the question is, at, at what cost and at what expense, expense of just having to take a pill or, or whatever every day to, to make that happen? Now, you know, if I had a terrible family history where everybody in the family ended up having knee replacements by the age of 50, I might consider that, you know, but, but fortunately it didn't happen all the time. Okay. And so, <clears throat> at the end of the day, people say, well, are we there yet? And I love this slide because, as I used to tell my kids when they were growing up, it's just over that next hill. So, <laughs> so anyway. Well, thanks. And that's